we're halfway through this series uh, in Matthew. It is written. Part of our look at Matthew, we're going through this and sort of breaking the book up into series. And so uh, this one, it's the Nativity story, Matthew chapter, end of chapter 1, all of chapter 2. But what's interesting about Matthew that he does that other writers in the New Testament don't do is he wraps everything that's happening around different scriptures. And so he's showing how through prophecy all of this was predicted, all of this was as God planned it. And so he chooses these five different references that he wraps the story around. So we've already looked at three of them in week one. We saw how Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy that one day there will be this child that signifies that God is with us. He's no longer just above us. Now he's also God with us. He gets this name, Emmanuel. And then week two, we talked about how even the place that Jesus would be born was foretold. It was predicted completely. You ask any scholar back then, where's the Messiah going to be born? And everyone's going to tell you, Bethlehem. Where is Jesus born? Right there in Bethlehem. The Magi are directed there because that's where God had planned it to be. And then week three, we saw how God's plan is unstoppable. Last week, we talked about how Herod he gets thwarted from trying to kill young Jesus that nothing can stop God's plans when he puts them into place. He does what he wants to do. And so this week we're going to look at the fourth reference that Matthew makes here. And it sort of piggybacks on to last week's. Because last week we talked about how God's in control. He does whatever he wants. His plan can't be thwarted. He is unstoppable. And so that raises some questions. And Matthew doesn't shy away from those. He leans into them. And so last week we saw he's in control when the plan goes into motion and goes great. And this week we're going to see how he's in control even when it looks like everything is lost. And so in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, he writes this. He says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children, she refused to be comforted because they were no more. And so this sort of answers the question that I think was left unsaid last week. That okay, if God is in control, then why does suffering happen? Why do bad things happen? like this happen? It's a common question. I think it's one that everybody has to wrestle with from time to time. If I'm completely honest, this is the most persuasive argument for me against the existence of God. It's the one that I have to do the most wrestling with out of any of them. It's probably, most people would probably agree with that. What I think we can see in this passage is there are three lessons that we can learn here about suffering that I think help us get our minds around it a little bit more. The first is this. The first is that free will can be a large component of suffering. See, God gives us the ability to choose. For us to choose and love God, it has to be a choice. If there's no choice, it's not love. It's just a command. I had this computer set up in my office in D.C. where my computer would constantly be looking for my cell phone. And when my phone entered the room, it would unlock the computer screen and say, welcome back. And it freaked people out. It was great. And so I just walk into the office and the computer is like Iron Man and Jarvis or something. Just like, welcome back, Jeremy. Like, awesome. And so it was great. Now, I could have programmed, like I programmed it what to say. I told it to say, welcome back. But I could have told it to say anything. I could have told it to say, hey, you're looking good today. <laughs> like, you know what, Jeremy, I'm really proud of you. Like, oh, thanks, computer. Like, I, <laughs> I could have programmed it to say anything I wanted. But if I had, none of those compliments would have felt anything like they would feel coming from a person. 
Because the person that chooses to say something like that to me, that they're choosing to do that. They have all the choice and they still say it. It's more meaningful. You, you feel warm. You're never going to feel the warm and fuzzies from your computer being like, hey, how are you doing? Like, it's just not going to happen. And so, God wants children, not robots. And so he gives us this ability to choose, which means that we can choose him or we cannot choose him. But we have to have that choice for this love to be genuine, for it to be love. Anything else is you're just making robots. Now, paired with that free will, every single one of us has this capacity for evil. Our, pri our basic inclination, our starting point, is we want to view ourselves as God. We want to call all the shots. We want to make all the decisions. That's just the way that everybody works. And that's exactly what Herod does here, right? He's got this title, King of the Jews. And he didn't fight and claw his way to the top of the political ladder in Judea just to have some baby show up and take it all away from him. He's not having that. He is the one who's going to stay on the throne. He's the one who's going to call the shots. And so we all have the same feelings. Like we all want to put ourselves on the throne. We all want to be the one that calls the shots. That's because all of us have this capacity to do evil. And then when we choose evil instead of choosing God, it doesn't just affect us, it affects other people. In Romans chapter 1, Paul sort of gives this excursus on what, it, what, what sin has done to the human condition. And it's the only place you get something like this. Because most of Paul's letters are just, they're occasional, which means he's writing to a specific thing that's happening in a specific church. Romans, he's sort of writing them and going, hey, this is all the stuff I believe, let me come preach it to you. It's sort of, so it's a different thing. So he does give us these broader theological ideas. And in Romans chapter 1, he gives us this really interesting insight. In verse 28, it says, And since they did not see it fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now look at the list of sins that show up in this list. Covetousness, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossip, slanders, insolent, haughty, boastful, disobedient to parents, heartless, ruthless. These are predominantly sins against other people. Frederick Bruner in his commentary on Matthew it says, hating revelation leads to hurting people. If people will be ungodly, they will be inhumane. And so when we use our free will to not choose God, eventually that's going to have ramifications. That's go and that's not going to mean, okay, yeah, so you're saying if I'm not a Christian, then I'm going to go murdering people. No, that's not what I'm saying. But it will lead you to a place where you will have ill effects on other people. It must. That's what sin does. We all carry around this capacity for great evil. But I think sometimes we underestimate it. We don't sometimes necessarily want to embrace just how dark we all have the ability to go. If you want to know how far human beings can go, you don't have to look any farther than the cross. Like the Son of God comes to earth and humans torture and murder him. If you will do that, what will you not do? The capacity is there for anything imaginable. And so some suffering that we endure is based on the free will choices that other people make. Herod has about 20 or so boys murdered here. Given the size of the town, the ages of the boys, they work out. There's no more than 30 children that we're really talking about here. 
But this is just one moment where Herod chooses to do something evil. And it's actually pretty unremarkable compared to some of the other things that Herod does in his lifetime. He kills his sons and wives like it's no big deal. At one point, he orders that upon his death, that one person from each of the prominent families in the land should be murdered. Why? So that at his death, everyone's mourning would be genuine. It was crazy. Thankfully, that order was not carried out. But it goes to show just how sick this guy was. And so sometimes suffering, not always, but sometimes suffering happens because we're given agency to do what we want. And sometimes that agency combined with our capacity for evil causes people to make some horrific choices. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is that What's interesting here is that Matthew and Jeremiah, they don't look to diminish suffering in any way. They don't try to explain it away. They embrace it. Jeremiah is writing to the people of Israel as the exile is happening, like right in the middle of it. And he doesn't tell them, well, just ignore your pain. He doesn't say that. He allows them to embrace it. Rachel is sort of the personification of all of the mothers in Israel. She died giving birth to her second son, Benjamin, one of Jacob's sons, who becomes one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And she becomes this matriarch figure of Israel. People look to her as their ancestor, mother, the same way they sort of look to Jacob as father. And so Jeremiah, what he does here is he reassures the mothers of Israel. He doesn't say, oh, well, it's not so bad. It's not what he says. Instead, he says, I I understand. And Rachel weeps with you from beyond the grave. And so what Matthew sees here is another type. We've talked about this in the series, how much of the way that Matthew finds these fulfillments is it's not, oh, well, here was the prediction, and here's the exact thing that that prophet was looking for. That only happens once here, when the prophet says he'll be born in Bethlehem, and then he's born in Bethlehem. Everything else, Matthew calls them fulfilled, which means that there's this extra meaning, this extra layer of stuff that gets packed into it because of Jesus. And so he sees another analogy that he can draw here. You've got these mothers in Bethlehem, which is near Rama, near the tomb of Rachel, mourning the loss of their sons. And he sees that, and he sees what else surrounds that in the Old Testament, and he can't help but see a parallel here. There's, there's a connection. There has to be. This is not a coincidence. Both Matthew and Jeremiah know, look, God has a plan for this grief, that he's doing something with it, that there's a larger thing that he's doing here. But they never discourage anyone for feeling the weight of that grief. They never take that away from them. It's embraced and it's felt. I think that's a really important lesson for us, because it's really easy when we're talking to someone who's walking through something that we want to encourage them. We want to say, oh, well, God's got a plan for your suffering. We want to say things to try to smooth things over. Often when you hit extreme suffering, you ask the why question a lot. Well, why is this happening? And we want to jump in right away and give answers. Well, God's got a plan for it. And Romans says this. And, but honestly, those answers aren't usually very helpful in the moment. Even if you knew why, it still isn't going to change anything. You still have to deal with those feelings. There are plenty of things in your life that you probably have absolutely no idea why they happened. I know I certainly do. But even if you had the answer, nothing changes. You're still left with that burden. Why is a poor question to ask? Because even if you could answer it, it wouldn't help. Instead, I think when we go through tough times, the question we've got to be asking is, what now? Or what do I do with this? Like, what happens next? 
And if you're with somebody who's grieving, who's going through something extremely difficult, I think the best thing you can do a lot of times is just sit and listen. Because there's not really going to be a ton you can say that's going to make it any better. Because your presence, your being there for them, that's going to mean more than anything you can say. And so that was the second thing. The third thing is that suffering ultimately is worked out for God's glory, and thus our benefit. See, we know how this plan works out. Is that this leads to Jesus being saved. See, Herod wouldn't have stopped looking for Jesus unless he had reason to believe that Jesus was dead. And so this terrible act happens, and it allows Jesus to live. There's sort of this ironic twist here that happens, where first, for Jesus to live now, innocents have to die. But for everyone to live forever, innocent Jesus is going to have to die later. And we can see the plan as it works out here. Sometimes our suffering, we can see immediately how it's going to benefit us. You think about like ballerinas, right? They're always walking around on their toes, things like that. Well, how do they do that? Well, they wear these things called toe shoes that have a wood block in the toe. And when you start practicing that, that wrecks your toes. Like, it's awful. They get bloody, you lose toenails, like all kinds of things like that. Like, you go through this incredible suffering, but at the end of it, you have this, you built up calluses, you have this ability now to dance the way that you're supposed to dance in these shoes. Uh, same thing as learning to play guitar, right? When you start learning to play guitar, it hurts because you haven't built up calluses on your fingertips yet. And so the, you'll play for a little bit, and then your hands will just be killing you, and you've got to stop. And you keep doing it. See, the, the solution isn't, well, I've got to get away from the suffering. I'll stop playing, and then I'll come back to it, and I'll be able to do it. It doesn't work that way. You've got to keep playing every single day to keep building those calluses so that then you're able to play as long as you want with no pain. It's not until you've done that, until you've done the hard work of building up those calluses, that you're able to do that. That suffering has an immediately foreseeable benefit in both of those cases. And there's other times where we can sort of see the why that our suffering is happening. Sometimes it's our choice, our free will, that causes our suffering. You get a speeding ticket because you exercised your free will to speed. And then you got caught. You did something and the immediate reaction to it was negative. Sometimes it's someone else's free will, like Herod in the text here. He chooses to go after the children and they suffer for it. If someone exercises their free will to punch you in the face, you will suffer. Sometimes suffering is just the laws of the universe at work. Like God creates everything and he puts these laws of physics and so forth into place. And the result of that sometimes causes suffering. If you're on a four-wheeler and you get thrown off it, gravity and inertia will cause you to suffer, right? Sometimes suffering is to refine our character. Sometimes you go through something and you learn lessons and you come out of it a better person for it. You come out looking more like Jesus. But that doesn't answer all suffering because sometimes it seems like good people suffer far more than bad people. It's like, well, why am I going through this when clearly this guy has a lot more work to do than I do, right? And so sometimes that explains it, but it doesn't stick as sort of a hard rule. None of these do. There's no one why that explains all suffering. And now sometimes it becomes obvious to us in hindsight, this is how a lot of ministries get started, where you go through something terrible, and then on the other side of it, realize, oh, I can use this to help other people. Our Celebrate Recovery Ministries work that way. The people who run those have been through that program, and it helped them, and now they're in a position to help other people. Jen Krogh, who's got this incredible testimony of weight loss and life change, She's now in a position to help other people through those things. And so that's why Lakeside has First Place for Health and the Daniel Plan. 
We wouldn't have those things without her and without her having gone through that hard, long process. There are times, though, that the answer just never comes. Sometimes we're not able to grasp why the things that are happening to us are happening. This week, our little Corgi Pepe had shoulder surgery to clean up some torn cartilage and restabilize his shoulder. Now, he has absolutely no idea why any of this is happening to him. We took him someplace, and then he passed out, he woke up, and now he's shaved, and he's got <laughs> staples in him and all this stuff, and he's just miserable. And especially now that we brought him home, because we're supposed to restrict activity for like four to six weeks with a corgi. Good luck with that. <laughs> and so we've got him hemmed in to this little tiny area in our family room between like the couch and the wall. and So he's got a good maybe like five feet by like 12 feet that has some obstacles in it so he can't get up a good sprint because that's what he wants to do. But if he does that, he's going to hurt his shoulder more and it's going to be terrible. And then we had to put the cone on him. He had to get the cone of shame because otherwise he's trying to lick at his shoulder and all this stuff. And so we had to do that. Although I did find, we, they had told us, well, you can just put a t-shirt on him. It's like, okay, well, how are you going to get a corgi with a hurt shoulder into a t-shirt? Like, these arms are not long enough to make that happen. But, but I did find online button-up shirts for dogs. And so he's got this little Hawaiian barbecue shirt that's coming. <laughs> so we can just like put it in and wrap it around and button him up and then be able to take the cone off. But he's itchy because they had to shave him. And now we're going to have to take him to the vet and get his staples out. And this whole thing is happening to him. They're all... Just, they seem terrible, and he's completely unable to grasp why it's happening. Well, why can't I go upstairs with you guys? Why am I stuck down here? You guys are sitting on the couch, and I'm stuck back here. And he just cries and cries and cries, poor little guy. He's unable to grasp why any of this is happening. But ultimately, it's all for his good. It is all for his benefit, because he was limping. He had some lameness in his right front leg, and... There was pain that was happening. He couldn't put all of his weight on that. Now, after the surgery, he's still we're like days out from surgery, and he's already putting more weight on his right front leg than he used to. So surgery worked. It's helping him. But now he's just miserable. Why am I going through all of this stuff? In a vacuum, these are all bad things. If you rolled up into my house and just started stapling my dog, like we would have words, right? But ultimately, we have this perspective that he doesn't have. That these are all good things for his benefit. To him, they all seem very terrible. But the reality is they're all for his good. And I say that because our inability for us to find a reason for our suffering does not negate the possibility that there is one. It's often argued that, well, if an all-powerful, all-loving God exists, then there wouldn't be suffering. Because if there's suffering, either it means He's not all-loving, that He is all-powerful, He could stop it, but He chooses not to, so He's not loving in that way. Or, He's not all-powerful. Maybe He is all-loving and He really wants to stop it, but He's not able to do so. That if you have a God that's all-powerful and all-loving that allows suffering to happen, that that doesn't connect. But I've just shown that there are plenty of times that our suffering has a purpose. We just might not be able to see what it is. So really, the problem is we can't perceive the reason. So the argument looks like this, that an all-powerful, all-loving God would not permit suffering without a good reason. I cannot think of such a reason, therefore there is no reason. Suffering exists, therefore God does not exist. But that's not really the reality here. It forgets how much we don't know. It better looks like this. An all-powerful, all-loving God would not permit suffering without a good reason. I cannot think of such a reason. I understand that my knowledge and understanding are hugely limited. Suffering exists, therefore this is a mystery. I totally get that this feels like a cop-out. I do. But there's so much that the 
that we don't know about God, that the Bible doesn't tell us about Him. And this is the thing, is we've sold for a long time, we've sold the Bible, we've sold Jesus as a way to have all the answers. When it's not true, we don't have all the answers. God has all the answers, but we don't. In fact, the Bible promises, promises us exactly the opposite. In Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. What we're given in Scripture is not all of the answers to everything in the universe. We're given everything that we need to serve Him. And it promises us nothing more than that. There are things that we'll just never know. I think with this, it, it's tough to accept that, well, what do you mean we don't know? Like, this seems like a cop out. Like, we're just. But look, if God was completely understandable, completely within our ability to comprehend Him, He wouldn't be worth worshiping. He'd just be another one of us. He's got to be more complex than we are. In Matthew's account here, though, we actually do get to see the purpose of this pain that happens. These mothers, these families may not have known it, they may not have felt it, but there was a reason. Jesus is saved from Herod's hand, and we see this theme in Matthew that we started to develop last week that keeps going on, that he's the new Moses. Just as Moses was saved from the slaughter of innocent children, so is Jesus in Egypt. Matthew sees these things and goes, this is not a coincidence. God's telling us something here. By connecting Jesus to prophecy, Matthew's pointing out God's ability to work out everything for His good. He's still in control. Even when others choose evil, He's still in control. And He's also not asking us to do anything He wouldn't do. If God is in control of Jesus dying on the cross, then we can trust that He's in control of everything. And think about this. Not even just because we think about, okay, well, Jesus was willing to come and suffer for us. Think about this. God knows what it's like to lose a child. That the Father experienced that while Jesus experienced the pain of it. There's nothing that we can go through that He doesn't understand from an experiential level. He went through it all. This is unique to Jesus. Christianity is the only religion that features a God with wounds. He's not up on a cloud, aloof, not knowing what we go through. He's experienced it all. He can relate to us. And so that tells me that even though I don't understand that there's a, what the purpose for my suffering may be, there must be one. Otherwise, he wouldn't have endured it. Why would he do it unless there was a reason for it? See, God doesn't promise to keep us from pain, but he does promise to shape it for our best interest. In Genesis 50, Joseph has endured incredible suffering at the hands of his brothers. And at the end of the book, he tells them this, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Tell us about, look, you meant this to be evil, but God has actually used this evil for good. He's turned it on its head. In Romans, later in chapter 8, Paul writes, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. That is not a promise that only good things will happen to you. That is a promise that when bad things happen to you, that there's a purpose and a plan for them. If anything, this promises bad things will happen to you. And that when they do, there's a reason for them. And so we can carry on here because we know that somehow, someday, it's going to be made right. And so we've got to adopt this long view that not, we're not just looking at this short period in our life or even the short period of our lives, but we've got to look in light of eternity when we talk about any of this. Even if we can't see the reason now, one day it's going to be made clear. 
And that's actually the context that Jeremiah is writing in. The bulk of this chapter, Jeremiah 31, is not about sadness. It's about rejoicing. It's quite the opposite. The verse Matthew brings up is the one sort of discordant note in this entire chapter. This is what the very next verse says in Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah 31, 16. Thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is reward for your work, declares the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. He says, don't worry, they will come back. There's reward. We're not done here. There's still hope. And he gives an even better promise at the end. In verse 31, he starts, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. There's a new covenant coming, is what Jeremiah is saying here. And this is exactly what Jesus comes to do. And so this is an exciting thing to look forward to. And Jeremiah is saying, I know it looks bleak. But if you just hold on, if you just keep the faith, there's reward here. It won't always be this way. And now, of course, the people that he's writing to, they didn't live to see Jesus come. And we see in the book of Hebrews, the hall of faith, the thing that marks everyone in Hebrews 11 is that they didn't live to see the things that they were promised be fulfilled. They were. Abraham was told you'll be the father of many nations. He didn't live to see that, but he came. Everyone in that chapter, they were told this, and they didn't see it in their time, but God fulfilled his word. Jeremiah says, I know you're grieving now, but hold on. And so we've got this hope in the middle of suffering. Why? Because Jesus identifies with our pain, and we know that one day he's going to make it all right. In Revelation chapter 7, John writes this. He says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. He said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst nor any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and He will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This vision that John sees of this great multitude, every nation, every language, every color, every culture, all together praising the Lord. This vision of the end, no more hunger, no more thirst, no more pain. It's all done, no more tears. See, we mourn now as well we should, but we won't forever. We will understand the mystery even if right now we don't. The end has not yet been written. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You that we have a God who 
identifies with us in our pain, that knows what we go through, and works all of it out with our best interest in mind. That we can trust you because you are in control. And because we know that your love for us motivates you to bring everything about for our benefit. Lord, help us to see that. Help us to fall back on that when we go through rough times in our life, when we face great suffering, when we face little suffering. Lord, help us to keep that perspective. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.